morning. This is Pastor Brad from Manual Baptist. We're glad to have you with us today. Um, last Sunday, we met for the first time after this census virus has hit. Uh, we had a great time. We had a great turnout. Awesome time being together as just a body of Christ. Just we hadn't seen each other in such a long time. If you're watching this, it's because you're not able to come out yet. We miss you. We're looking forward to seeing you again. Can't wait until that happens. Or you're not in the Columbus area, and we're glad you're watching, glad you're with us from your living room, wherever it is. And we're just uh, looking forward to going through God's Word together, just encouraging you uh, in your walk with the Lord, showing you Jesus Christ, learning together. That's our goal. We're in John chapter 17 this morning, verses 1 through 5. As we, as we come to this passage, we're simply seeing uh, the Lord pray. He has completed now his teaching with the disciples in this final discourse, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And now he's, now he's entering into, you know, really, really it's the Holy of Holies. He's entering into the very chambers of God himself, into the very presence of God. He, has, he always operates within the, within the presence of God. But now we see the intimacy of his heart with his Father in prayer. Now we see the reality of who he is, just the clarity of who he is as he prays. It really reveals to us, not just the chapter, but these verses here specifically, what's the purpose of God's word? Why did God reveal himself to us in the letters and, and books and chapters that are, that are laid out in the scriptures? Why did God do all that? For a couple of reasons that come to the top, you know, when I when I when I consider what those reasons are and why God did that, I see ultimately that purpose being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. I see the goal of God's word being fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus Christ. I see the purpose of the word of God being fulfilled in in the ministry of Jesus Christ here in these verses. So these verses are significant in my heart as I consider the the totality of the word of God. What is the purpose of God? Well, we're going to see that. It's revealed in his prayer, it's revealed in his life here, how he ministered, now how he prays, what he shows us from his heart, what he reveals from his heart, what he reveals about who he is. It just affirms and is in harmony with everything that he has taught and proclaimed and shared to his disciples and, and to Israel in the three years that he's been publicly ministering. So what are those purposes? What are the two? I'm going to mention two purposes this morning. I think these are the purposes that just rise, rise to the top of, of all the other reasons why the Word of God was written. You know, it was given that we might grow, we might be disciples, that it might, we might be transformed, all these things. But, but there are two elements in Scripture, I think, that come to the top. The first one that we usually mention as, as maybe the reason for the writing of the Word of God, I'm going to mention that number two. Let's look at this first purpose, the first reason. I think the, I think the highest purpose... The number one reason the Word of God was given to us, from Genesis to Revelation, was this. It was the glory of God. It was doxological. It was to exalt God Himself. It was to exalt Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father. It was to exalt God. It's to bring honor and glory to God. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to see it modeled in the, in the prayer of Jesus. We're going to see it modeled in the life of Jesus. And we're simply going to ask, what does that mean for us? So let's, let's take that walk together. So the first purpose, the first way in which we glorify God is this. It's simply when we, when we, when we fulfill His purpose for our life, when we fill, fulfill His plan for our life, when we walk according to the timetable that, that God has for us. He saves us, and He saves us for a purpose, and He sets us on a path. And we're to follow His path. We're to, we're to follow His lead. We're to follow His footsteps. And we're to patiently walk with Him, not to run ahead of Him, but to say, God, what would you have me to do? How would you have me to do it? When would you have me to do that? Jesus prayed here in verse 1. When he had spoken these words, the final discourse, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, The Father, the hour has come. When he had spoken these words, he just says, And I have overcome the world. He's overcoming, showing the power of that victory here in prayer. He's going to show the power of that overcoming as he goes to the cross. And now he says, That's happening because the hour has come. Has come for what? The hour has come for what? What's the purpose of this hour? What's going on? Well, we know. He is laying himself down as a lamb, the lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God for the sins of the world. He is, he is setting himself up and lifting himself up as provision for sin, as, as provision, as a means, as the way to heaven, the only way. He is, he is revealing himself to be the, the way, the truth, and the life. 
as he lifts himself up on the cross. He says, the hour has come for that. When he began his ministry, his very first miracle in Canaan, when he turned the water into wine, his, mo his mother came to him and says, we have, a, we have a problem here. And he said in John chapter 2, verse 4, he, he said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? He says, my hour has not yet come. He communicated from his very first public ministry to the cross, everything that I will do, it's going to be for the purpose of glorifying God by offering myself as a savior for the world. The spotless lamb of God. Everything points to that. Galatians 4.4, 4, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. And so we honor God when we say, God, what is your plan for me? What's your purpose for me? God, I want to know. God, I pray. God, would you show me your purpose for me today? What would you have me to do today? How would you have me to move forward? How would you have me to be still and to know that you are God? How would you have me to wait upon you so that your higher goal is accomplished in my life? Every believer ought to be aware every day of the purpose of God in their life and striving to accomplish that goal and that purpose. The second the way in which we bring uh, honor and glory to God is, is also found in verse 1. It's, it's, it's when we honor God himself. The persons of the Trinity, the persons of the Godhead, the three persons, the three in one, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus says here in verse 1, he continues, his Father, glorify your Son. We see the Father-Son relationship throughout uh, this prayer, these, these verses here in chapter 17. The Holy Spirit isn't specifically mentioned in these verses, but he is, he is completely intertwined and immersed in the heart of Jesus Christ as he prays. Jesus has just been teaching the disciples about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in this final discourse. He has explicitly lifted up the ministry of the Holy Spirit without being spoken in word. He is all over the pages, the words of the prayer of Jesus Christ. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is here. We honor, when we glorify God, we honor the ministry of the Father, the preeminence of the Father. We honor the, 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 the ministry of the Son of God, His provision for salvation, and we honor the ministry of the Spirit of God who, who seals and guarantees our salvation and who, who, who uh, brings the fruit of the Spirit into our life and the character of Christ into our life. And so we glorify God and we say, God, it is my goal to honor you, to honor you as my Father, Jesus as my Lord and Savior, Holy Spirit as, as my guide, as my protector, as my guarantee, as the one who moves my heart. Father, glorify your Son. Father, Son, Father, Son. That relationship is rich in the prayer of Jesus Christ, in the, in the relationship that is laid before us here. The third way that, the, that God is glorified here in the pages of Scripture, in the, in the life of Jesus Christ, and in the prayer of Jesus Christ here, is, is when we utilize the blessings, the favor of God, to turn around and use those things for the glory of God, to serve Him. Jesus prays in verse 1, He says, Father, glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. That the Son may glorify you. He says, he says Father, Pour out your splendor upon your son. Pour out your glory upon your son for this purpose, that the son would glorify you. How is the son going to do that? How is Jesus going to do that here? He's going to humble himself and go to the cross. He's going to yield in obedience to his father and go to the cross. He's going to give up his life for you and I and go to the cross. Jesus Christ, just the Father, the God in your life, just, just, I want you to just for a moment consider all the ways He is blessing you, that He has blessed you, your talents and your gifts and your abilities, the people in your life, the opportunities in your life, the grace and mercy, strength, the peace of God. Think about all the blessings of God in your life. Why does, he, why does He bless His children? Why does He bless us so richly? He blesses us so that we might turn around and use those blessings to humbly serve Him, to yield our life to Him, to say, God, whatever it is that I'm going to do in my life, it will be a service to You. In humbleness, I will lay my, my vocation, my marriage, my relationships, my thoughts, 
my entertainment, everything that I do, I will humbly lay it before you and I will use it as a means to serve you. I'll use your blessings in my life as a means to serve you. Father, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. That needs to be our prayer. God, richly bless me so that I might turn around and use that blessing to serve you, to honor you, to glorify you with my life. Chapter 2, verse 11, when he turned the water into wine, his first miracle. John wraps that up and he says this, this, this is the first of the signs that Jesus did at Cana in Galilee. And he manifested, Jesus manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Glory and faith go together. His disciples believed. The fourth way that we glorify God and is revealed in the prayer of Christ here and the life of Jesus Christ here is when we simply recognize the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. We recognize his sovereignty over us. He says, since you have given him, since you have given me authority over all flesh to give, he has the authority over all mankind. He has the authority to give us what we need. He has authority over our lives. Romans 14, 9, to this end Jesus Christ died and he lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Matthew 28, 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he's recognizing that here as he prays. Hebrews 2, 28, everything will be put in subjection under his feet, the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. There's nothing that, that is not under his authority. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. The world has not yet bowed in authority to him, yet he has authority over all mankind and over this world. And as his program is fulfilled, as his plan for mankind is fulfilled, ultimately he will wield full authority over mankind. It brings us, and as we continue in this prayer, it brings us to the second purpose of the Word of God. The first purpose is this, it's the glory of God. As we read from the pages of God's Word, as it changes our lives and transforms our lives, the highest goal is then that our lives will be an honor to Christ. We will glorify God in everything that we do. It will transform us and change us. It happens because of the second purpose of God's Word. It is, that second purpose is soteriological. The second purpose is salvation, the salvation of our souls, salvation through faith. The Word of God was written so that we might come to know Christ. The Word of God was written so that a Savior would be presented to and offered and made available to us to a lost world. When Adam and Eve sinned, it changed everything. And the Word of God was, was revealed and laid to us and showed us the means by which we can restore our relationship with the Father, to have our sins cleansed through Christ. That becomes the, the second highest purpose of the Word of God, the glory of God and the provision of a Savior, salvation. We see here in these, in these words, it is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. It, you know, salvation, it can't, I can't, it can't be earned and I can't buy it. I can't steal it. I can't, I can't inherit it. Um, I can't trade it for something else. Uh, I simply have to yield myself and accept a free gift, a gift that I can't manufacture. I have to say, Lord, Lord, I receive the gift of life. I acknowledge my need before you. I acknowledge that I'm empty. There's nothing I bring to you. And, and with open arms, you receive that gift of life. Chapter 17, verse 2, as he continues in prayer, he says, My goal is to give eternal life. I have all authority to give eternal life to all that you have given me. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. John 6, 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. We see the Father here. We see, we see him sovereignly oversee salvation. And we see Jesus Christ provide salvation to us to be the very Lamb of God, the provision for sin. We see the Spirit of God uh, seal and guarantee that work of salvation. Uh, it, is, it is the Godhead that we exalt and honor. As we reflect on our salvation, it is God who did the work in our life and continues to do that. The second element of salvation here is not only that it's a free gift, it is found in relationship. It is experienced, it is realized, it comes to fruition when we have a relationship with Christ. Verse 3, Jesus says these words as he prays, and he says, This is life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. As he prays, he lays up before the disciples, again, 
that he is the savior of this world, that salvation is found in knowing Christ. It is found in experiencing a relationship with Christ. It is having an intimacy with Jesus Christ. The word know is, is used throughout scripture and it's used the first time in Genesis chapter four where Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived. It is, it is a picture of physical intimacy that a husband and a wife have. And that physical intimacy ultimately flows from, from a spiritual intimacy that we have with God. It is heightened in that spiritual intimacy. That spiritual intimacy that we have with God is, is the deepest level of meaning that we can ever have in our life. The physical intimacy we have with our, with our spouse is only, is only heightened in meaning and in purpose and intent when we, when we understand the relationship we have with Christ. Um, it touches us to every core of our being. It changes us in every fiber of our body. We are, we are transformed by that relationship that we have with Christ. It is a relationship. We are called to know Christ. Hosea 6.3, let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers and as the spring rains the water on the earth. To know God is to know the blessing of God, the favor of God. Jeremiah 24, 7. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord. And they shall be my God and I will be their God. And they shall return to me with their whole heart. To be a child of God is to know God. It's to have a relationship with him. It's to long for him more than I long for anything else in my life. It's to want him more than I want anything else in my life. It's to think about him. It's to settle my mind and my heart around him more than I settle my mind and my heart around anything else in my life. It's to put Jesus Christ first. It's to know him and experience. It's to commune with him as Jesus is communing here in prayer. It's to talk with him in prayer. It's to receive his his, his words of life into my life through, through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit and through, and through prayer. Jesus emphasizes here, there is one God. It is God the Father. There are three persons of that, of that Godhead. There are three persons of the Trinity. There is one God. He says, and that they might know God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is the only time that Jesus Christ uses the term Jesus Christ and applies it to himself. We see that we see Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures, but here we see Jesus apply it to himself. He is Jesus, as the name given to him, that shows his humanity. He is Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the promised Messiah. It shows his divinity. He is revealing his humanity. He is revealing his divinity. His divinity. He is affirming all of that. That perfect relationship. He is sent by God for a purpose. It takes us back it takes us back then to the higher purpose it is the glory of God as we continue in prayer we see that we glorify God we honor God when we complete the work when we complete the mission that he's given to us to do in verse 4 Jesus prays and he continues and he says I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do I glorified you I glorified you on the earth and here's how I did it I finished I completed the work that you gave me to do which is interesting that he puts it that way because he hasn't gone to the cross yet. But see, his will is already completely surrendered and yielded to his Father. He has settled it in his heart. It is as though it has already happened because it has. It is as certain as though it has already happened because it has. Because there's nothing that, can, that, that, will, that will cause him to deviate from that path. It is a, it is a settledness of heart. No matter, no, ma no matter what may come, come what may, Nothing will sidetrack him from, from laying down his life for us. He says, I've already completed the work. It's, it's done. I have finished the work. He did everything that was asked of him. He did it with a heart that honored G, uh, his father. He did it by giving glory to his father over and over and over again. He affirmed and spoke the words and ministered according to the timetable of his father. But he was glorified. He was glorified and he glorified God through, through his character. He, was, he is one with God. I and the Father are one. In character and in nature and in essence, he glorified God fully. The other way that we see the glory of God is, is those visible manifestation, manifestations that we, all, that we always think about. And, and um, those manifestations in the Old Testament and New Testament and the glory of God and man cannot stand before the illuminating glory of God. 
It is, those, it is that very expression of the glory of God that he set aside in Philippians 2. And he set these things aside while he's here on earth. Only at the Mount of Transfiguration did he allow it to come through so that, so that three of the disciples could see him, in a, in a limited sense, the glory of God. It is that glory he set aside, but yet is veiled within him still right now as he prays and as he speaks. So how do we glorify God? Well, we glorify God by acknowledging the pre preeminence of Jesus Christ. The preeminence of Christ. Colossians 1.8 reminds us that Jesus Christ, he is the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from, from the dead, and that in everything he might have preeminence. He might be preeminent. Verse 5, as he continues, he prays these words. He says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world began. We can't even imagine the words. We can't even imagine what's taking place here. We can't imagine the reality that, that as the disciples were here, God in the flesh was right here talking to God in heaven. Jesus Christ is in the very presence of his Father. He's communi communing in the very presence of his Father while he's here on earth. The Father and the Son, one. You know, that's not a surprise. That's how, that's how John starts off. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. We see, we see, we see that. 1 Peter 1.20, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but He was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, but He has made Him known, John 1.18. I and the Father are one, John 10, 30. He just makes it manifestly clear. The Jesus that is praying here, the Jesus that has lifted his eyes to the Father, the Jesus who is, who is in this room while they're walking, and he's praying to his Father that is, as the disciples watch him. This is the same Jesus that we see in the Old Testament. We see, we see Jesus as the creator of the universe. We see Jesus in the burning bush with Moses, we see Jesus, the Lord, the angel of the Lord, lead Israel in, the, in, the, in the, the cloud by day and the fire by night. We see Jesus with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as that fourth person in the fire. We see Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration. We see Jesus. We see Jesus imprinted on the pages of Scripture. Before he's even in this room praying with the disciples, here he was meeting with God's people throughout history. He himself. He fashioning the world in his own hands. He meeting with God's people. No one can see the Father face to face. They would only get glimpses of the Father. But we would also see Jesus Christ appear in the Old Testament in multiple ways. That's the Jesus who's praying here. That's the one who's praying here. We're reminded... As we look, as we look at uh, just different people, we see Moses. We see, we see Moses. He hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. We see Gideon. He said, "Alas, for I have now seen the angel of the Lord face to face." We see Isaiah. "Woe is me, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts." Manoah, who is the, the father of Samson, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. Even John, who's writing, writing these words right here, he meets the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation. He says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. We see, that, we see those ministries. In Exodus, we see Moses. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the clouds settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Jesus Christ here is in the very presence of his Father with glory. You know, in the scriptures, we see God's people encountering the glory of the Lord and fearing for their life because of the holiness of God, because of the holiness of, of revealed Christ, because of his, because of his, uh, his glory, and a, just an absolute reminder of, of their sinfulness and, and their unworthiness before God. And yet we see in Genesis 3, 8, and they heard the sound of the the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and Eve hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That's after they sinned. But this gives us a glimpse that before they ate of that fruit, there was times of communion with, with Christ, 
here? Times of communion with God here? Walking with him in the cool of the day? Somehow God manifesting himself, walking with them? Doing it freely? And then when sin came, it changed everything. But just think about that. As Jesus is praying here in verse 5, he says, Glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Before the world began, there was Christ. But you know, when he went to the cross, he offers to every believer the beauty, the blessing, and the presence of God in their life. Think about that. Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life, and in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Even the psalmist understood that, that the presence of God in his life, not the visible presence, not the glory of God standing right next to him, but the presence of the relationship of God in his life, the presence of the work of God in his life, the very presence of God, the blessing, the favor of God in his life, the presence of God in his life was joy. He had joy because there was a relationship with God. There was an awareness and a communion and a fellowship with God. Acts 3.20, it is prayed that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. It is, it is proclaimed, times of refreshing in our lives, they come from the presence of the Lord. As we're walking with the Lord today, the greatest blessing that God could ever give you is, is the blessing of His presence, of the refreshing work that, that the, His presence accomplishes in our life, how it transforms us and it brings the peace of God, and it brings the joy of the Lord into our life. And every believer who has been transformed by it it is, it is revealed in their life, the countenance of their life, how they live, the way they live, the choices they make. The presence of God is, is life-changing. The presence of God in our life, because, well, we're going to see that. John 14, 23, Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he's going to keep my word. My Father will love him, and, and we, we will come to him and make our home with him. The presence of God. Right now, if you're a child of God, he is present in your life. He lives in your life. He lives in your heart. The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Christ lives in your heart. Jesus, the Spirit of God, infuses the character of Christ into our life as we obey and as we follow, as we yield, as we submit, as we pursue His plan for our life. As we do all of that, we experience the peace and the grace, the mercy of God, the very presence of God. It's not something we have to fear. It is something that, that we are to be in reverence of and awe of, there is, there is a sense in the word, of, the, word of, the word of fear, the holiness of God, so that it is a compelling motivation in our life to love God with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our mind. It is the presence of God that makes the difference. If you have a relationship with Christ this morning, then you're keenly aware of his presence in your life. He's with you in your thoughts. He's with you in your, in your goals for the day. He's with you in, in the drive of your life and the mission of your life. He sets that mission. He sets that purpose. He says, you're to be a soul winner. You're to live in obedience. You're to show Jesus Christ to a lost world. Everything you do is to reveal Christ to a lost world. That happens when the presence of Christ is revealed in our life. As we settle our heart and quietly listen in our heart to the voice of the Lord and, and follow his leading, the presence of the Lord goes with us. Galatians 2.20 reminds us it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's the presence of, of Christ in our life. See, he loved me and he gave himself for me. What, what motivation? He prays here of, of the glory of God. He prays here of the purpose of his coming, to give glory to his Father. He accomplishes that by laying down his life for us, that we might, that we might receive salvation through faith in Christ. He makes himself available. He made himself available to you. It was a moment in time when you yielded your heart to, to Jesus Christ. You gave your life to him. And you entered into a relationship with, with the Heavenly Father through Christ. Now the Spirit of God lives in you. He is present in your life. Do you listen to him? Do you acknowledge him? Do you follow him? Are you aware of his leading? Do you, do you pursue and desire the heart of the Lord? Do you love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind? Do you love the people in your life? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? Is there fruit that's, that's being revealed in your life, the fruit of Christ because of the presence of Christ? Is your heart, is, it, is your soil, the soil of your heart, is it receptive? Is God able to, to turn and, 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 and to cultivate the soil of your life and, and, and the fruit of Christ comes out of your life? Or may our hearts never be hard and calloused to the work of Christ. Because when we are aware of the presence of God, 
then we are soft and pliable and tender and we're conformable to the image of Christ. Now then our prayer is this, that it would be I, the Christ that would live in me and not myself. It'd be the goals of Christ in my life, not myself. Lord, we pray as Jesus prayed here that you would glorify us by showing and extending favor into our life to help us to follow after you, to be obedient to you, to yield our hearts and lives to you, to use the the abilities, the talents, the gifts you've given to us to serve you, to serve this world for the cause of Christ, to show Jesus Christ in everything that we do. God, glorify us for one reason, that we might glorify you. God, pour your favor into our life that we would in turn live for you wholly, that Christ would be the reason, the power for which we live. God, help us. Bring us together in the communion of prayer before you. May we unite our hearts with you every day, every moment, so that we would live out even the reality of this prayer that Jesus prayed as he communed with the Father, you've given us that blessing. May we set aside and confess any sin that would be a barrier between us and the Lord right now, any habit that would be a barrier between us and the Lord right now, anything that would stand as a wall between us and the Lord. God, break that down in our hearts and restore the the beauty of of fellowship and communion. We pray, use us for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us today.